This video contains spoilers of You seasons 1 through 3 and mentions slash in-depth discussions that may be triggering to some viewers, such as mental illness, eating disorders, ableism, sanism, self-harm slash suicide, and domestic violence. If you or someone you know is struggling, please reach out for help. Viewer discretion is heavily advised. As we've seen the story of the guy who's charming but ultimately is like really possessive. But his motivation for killing, his reason why he would stalk someone, his reason why he would do due diligence on someone like Beck is totally gendered. There's, there's obviously this pattern where like young men seem to really believe that they're, o they're owed a form of attention that they feel they're not getting. It's not, in I don't think it's intrinsic mm -hmm. in men. I actually think it's because of the stories we're told by the media we've we've uh, we've consumed. we've consumed over our lives a lot of these things that we've just sort of lazily accepted and consumed in the past and passed off as as like a like a desirable relationship model is crazy how do you get back into the mindset of this uh sociopathic psycho what do you think it says about our society that people are attracted to this uh, psychopath? yeah i have to say he to me is an allegory he's a metaphor he's a commentary he's not a real person i don't think that we could actually clinically diagnose joe how much we are willing to be patient and forgive someone who inhabits a body that looks something like like mine the color of my skin my gender these sorts of things these sorts of uh, privileges and points the finger a little bit at the viewer to make them question their own allegiances to these characters and you know maybe take that into their you make the decision yeah mm -hmm. life. hello you out of all the long and pretentious videos you could have clicked on today you clicked on mine are you flirting with me <laughs> sorry Hello, hello, I'm Shakespeare, not Shakespeare, and it's easy to tell the difference between us because I have a hat to cover my big ass forehead, unlike some people. If you're new here, you're an associate I avoid eye contact with when I see you out in public. Don't wave at me. I don't know you. But if you're returning, hey bestie, how you doing? What are you getting for Christmas? What are you getting me for Christmas? So I recently finished watching season three of the hit Netflix series, You. You don't usually hear the words hit and Netflix series in the same sentence for legal reasons, but the show is doing well, like really well. The mark season one alone left on social media when it first came to the platform was enough to cause the rapture. I'm talking Tom and Jerry memes to the left and and misogyny to the right. We were very busy that day. <laughs> but there's something really great about you. I mean, for one, you're really pretty and you're smart and so funny. But enough about you. Let's talk about the show for a minute. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! I don't know if it's the social media presence surrounding it or the hilariously dislikable characters, but it's one of those series that I feel pop culture will be loyal to no matter what happens, the way most people are about Stranger Things or more recently, Squid Game. On the surface, it reads like your run-of-the-mill psychological thriller, right? It was a typical lifetime slot filler with drama and sex and serial killer killer love interest. But once you dive deeper, you find that everyone has a different opinion on what the show is really about. So I want to explore that with you today, discussing four main sources. What Caroline Kepnes, the author of the book series, thinks. What Sarah Gamble, the co-producer and writer of the television adaptation, thinks. What Penn Badgley, who plays Joe Goldberg on the show, thinks. And then we'll do a brief analysis of what the fans of the show think. Spoiler alert, it's just stigma and bad vibes. Sort of like my entire college experience. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to pretend the book and the adaptation are the same thing. Think of the book like an extension of the show where we get to see more of Joe's thoughts in relation to the adaptation's portrayal of his actions. I'm going to be focusing primarily on season one, but we'll get into some season three shenanigans when it feels right. So buckle up, go get some snacks, play some Christmas music. I don't give a fuck. This is the result of a month straight of work, 37 pages of notes, 42 sources, hundreds of submissions to sift through, and 45 pages of script. So I ask you again, what are you getting me for Christmas? 
I'm not a big fan of the romance genre, especially not the infamous romantic comedy. They're usually laden with cringy moments and face-sucking grotesqueries. Sure, I've watched Clueless and I've read Much Ado About Nothing. I've watched John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John drive off into the sunset. Literally, drive off into the sunset. And I've seen romantic comedies come to life before my very eyes. Remember when Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds got married on that slave plantation? So romantic. That's what I dislike about the romance genre. The saliva, the formulaic plots, the fact that they all have one thing or another to do with Blake Lively. Because here's Penn Badgley, and Penn Badgley plays Joe Goldberg, a hopeless romantic and sappy gentleman seemingly out of place on a show dedicated to blood, near-death experiences, and used tampon hoarders. But that's the thing about not really caring much for the romance genre. You find it in media you're not really looking for it in. Horror, slapstick comedy, psychological thrillers. Romance has become such a cultural touchstone that we gauge our own success by it and judge others if they don't have it. Joe Goldberg knows exactly what I mean. Always the lover, never the loved. He goes to extraordinary lengths in order to be the perfect boyfriend for his love interest, Beck. He's a great listener, he pays attention, commits, and he commits intensely. But like summer at the end of 500 days, Beck is gone. Unreachable to the man who desperately loved her. At the end of the book, as Joe listens to a wedding happening on the other side of the woods that he stands in, he understands this loneliness. He makes peace with it. I will probably die alone, he says, as Chet and Rose, the wedding goers on the other side of the trees, vow to spend the rest of their lives together. Of course he'll die alone. He's a tragic hero. After all, his one true love, Beck, is lying dead in a grave at his feet. Dead because he strangled her twice an unspecified amount of time prior, and he'll never get to reap the benefits of all of his hard work and aggressive dedication. She will die loved, and he, hmm, well, at its core, you fits the mold of any classic romantic comedy, and this is not unintentional. Caroline Kepnes, the author of the original book, as well as its two sequels, Hidden Bodies and You Love Me, set out to make a love story that could rival the greatest. She wanted it to be full of whimsical dialogue and star-crossed lovers. Joe takes center stage as the intelligent, sensitive male lead, his words, not mine, and checks off boxes that Hollywood puts in fine print when they green light these sort of things. He's conventionally attractive in the Patrick Dempsey, Dr. McDreamy sort of way. He's able-bodied, as most leads across genres are, and he's white. So very white. He is the essence of what Hollywood requires for romantic comedies. In Rom-Com, Our Failure to See Black Romantic Comedies, Soraya Roberts examines how cultural whitewashing has caused audiences of the classic romantic comedy to look the other way from black-led romance movies. Despite there being an abundance, sometimes an overabundance depending on who's making them, of black-led romance movies, they rarely reach broad audiences. Even when these movies do well in the box office, like 2002's Brown Sugar, they're still met with reluctance. As a studio executive said of a possible Brown Sugar sequel, quote, love does not really resonate with black people. Comedy does, end quote. Did, did he just call me a, this narrowing and othering of blackness, as well as the narrowing and othering of all divested identities like people of color, queer people, neurodivergent people, plus size people, mentally ill people, and disabled people has led the classic rom-com genre to be overwhelmingly whitewashed, cis, able-bodied, able-minded, and heterosexual. So Joe is all of these things because he has to be in order for wider audiences, the characters he seduces, and everyone pulling the strings to find him appealing and disarming enough to star in a romantic comedy. He is also resilient in his quest for love, as most male leads are. No is not a word in his vocabulary. Just like Jake Gyllenhaal getting Anne Hathaway's number from someone who was not Anne Hathaway in Love and Other Drugs, therefore foregoing consent, or how Martin Lawrence takes the license plate number off the back of his partial love interest car and shows up to her job unwelcome in a thin line between love and hate, Joe Goldberg will do anything to make sure he and Beck are together. As he says in chapter 2 of the novel before he tells the audience that he's been staking out Beck's house without her knowledge, quote, love takes work, 
end quote. This is where you as a romantic comedy becomes subversive in my opinion. It takes these quirky original tropes of bygone romantic comedies like cute stalking moments and it turns them on their head. It bloodies them. Suddenly, Joe is not the dashing, wise Dr. McDreamy. Suddenly, he's Patrick Bateman, staring at himself in the mirror as he has sex with an unnamed woman. This is what Caroline Kepnes intended. She wanted to make a romance novel without the gloss or fog that usually mask predatory behaviors in all of our favorite films. She wanted to create a love and other drugs where Jake Gyllenhaal straight up mercs Anne Hathaway after stealing her number, you know, before Taylor Swift gets to him first. She wanted to create a twilight where Edward Cullen stalked Bella Swan, watched her while she slept, climbed into her window without her knowing or consenting, and gaslit her for like, what, six months before he ultimately caused her death? Oh. Sorry, did I summarize the actual plot again? In other words, Caroline Kepnes wanted to create a novel that Stephanie Meyer would write unironically, and I think she succeeded in that, while also creating a novel that would ruin every romance that came before it. Because now, we can't look away from how similar you is to the classics, even while it remains subversive. On page 23, Joe states, Quote, sometimes you have to play around with the facts in order to get the girl. I have seen enough romantic comedies to know that romantic guys like me are always getting into jams like this." End quote. The way in which Joe gets into these jams usually comes about through his use of social media, which is ironic because Joe often laments about how society stares at their screens until their eyes pop out and how we're all becoming slaves to the internet and yada, yada, yada. Let me look at Instagram for 18 hours and peace. But he utilizes social media and his phone in general just as much as say Beck, but the way in which he uses it makes Joe, and by extension, the audience, think that he's so much better than these shallow, vapid city girls of the Peach Salinger persuasion. Spoiler, he's not. Joe uses social media to get closer to his love interests, which sounds harmless in theory. The first thing most people do when they meet someone new is to try for their socials, especially because giving out phone numbers in this day and age is like telling someone where you live, which is nothing at all like the empty house tours or posts with your new keys on social media. Seriously, try to refrain from doing that. Joe starts by searching Beck's name. She's somehow the only Guinevere Beck in the world, according to him, and this proves that, quote, the internet was designed with love in mind. From there, he consumes information about her that he finds in bios that accompany her writing on various platforms, and he makes sure to knock her down a peg, as we soon find is something he does a lot with his love interests, by saying she writes blogs and thinly veiled diary entries, as opposed to the more highbrow essays and short stories. He finds out that she was born on Nantucket, that her father passed away due to addiction, that she was waitlisted and accepted into Brown University, that she has a brother named Clyde and a sister named Anya. And then, ever so easily, Joe finds out where Beck lives. She lives on Bank Street, a quote, tony, sleepy, ridiculously safe, and expensive West Village area, end quote. The housing is provided by Brown University for winners of their essay contest. It's a parlor level apartment, which matters because Beck doesn't have curtains, like not even the useless sheer ones that are used more so for decoration than privacy. Not even blinds, not even a sheet. And this matters not because I'm blaming Beck for the subsequent ease Joe experiences with watching her every sometimes naked move, but because it wickles out another theme within the show. Everyone thinks they're safe. This is a romantic comedy where it's okay for men to banish no from their vocabulary. Not only does Beck's decision to throw it back like that Tom and Jerry meme reflect her alleged desire to be watched, making everyone around her a voyeur to the inner workings of her personal life, it also reveals that she doesn't really expect anyone to be standing outside her window with malicious intent. And if she does, Joe is quite possibly the last person on that list. It's not just because he's a disarming lead in a romantic comedy, but it's because Joe rarely gets the time of day from his leading lady, Beck. Sure, romantic leads may be reluctant to fall in love, they may start off with the infamous enemies to lovers trope, but they always, always drift back together by the end of the movie. That's the romantic part of the romantic comedy. In the television show, the attempt to paint their relationship as a similar love story is clear. Much of Beck's characterization has been watered down from the distant, 
wanton woman she was in the book. She seems to genuinely like Joe in the television adaptation, and it makes me sick. Of course, regardless of medium, Joe is an unreliable narrator. It's possible we're viewing his projection of Beck rather than the real Beck. This is harder to convey in a television show where we expect to be able to trust our own eyes rather than a book where we're forced to realize everything Joe sees is biased. But going strictly off of dialogue and direct feelings that Beck relays to her friends, which we have access to thanks to Joe's stalking, we see that Beck was not into Joe the way typical women leads are in romantic comedies. She goes days, sometimes weeks, without talking to him. Even when her friends urge her to, she very rarely calls or texts. She stands him up on numerous occasions in favor of other people, sometimes even lying to him and saying that she has school assignments that need finishing or class meetings that don't exist. For much of the novel, Beck remains distant from Joe. She quite literally calls him a maybe, not a definite, yet he concocts this idea in his head that she's all over him. For instance, when they have sex for the first time, Joe finishes within 8 seconds, and that's whatever, it happens. After they finish, Beck begins to distance herself even further from Joe, telling her friends that she got too deep too fast again, end quote, referencing her last premature relationship. Even after Joe kills Peach, who he thought served as a blockage in the relationship, Beck still goes weeks without reaching out. As she confides in her therapy letters to herself, she quote, reels in men and loses interest when she has them, end quote. That's why she imagines herself getting married to different men despite not really wanting a man marriage, or why she hooks up with people like Dr. Nikki, who has a wife and kids. She quote, loves to be wanted. She loves new things, end quote. And Joe is just one of those things that's new to her until he isn't. Caroline Kepnes created a female lead in her romantic movie that didn't ascribe to traditional romantic dynamics. She didn't fall head over heels and dedicate herself solely to Joe upon meeting him. She didn't wait by the phone for his call. Throughout most of the novel, she acts in her own very best interest, or as Joe would say as he strangles her, she was solipsistic to the bone and she was blasphemous because all she wants is her. Beck was selfish. That shouldn't be a death sentence, but we can at least admit that her actions, especially in the novel, makes her a bad person. And that's not something you see every day in romantic comedies. The fact that Joe doesn't end up with any of his love interests throughout all of the seasons, despite giving it his all, is probably the most subversive part of the book and television adaptation. True love in this world doesn't conquer all like it has in so many romantic comedies before. Joe is alone, a male romance lead without his leading lady. I wonder whose fault that is. I think one of the juiciest things about being a human being is diving into your own problematic desires and the contradictions within ourselves, seeing what's fun in a fantasy and what's scary in real life. Sarah Gamble. Joe Goldberg is scary, not just because of that emotionless yet feral face Penn Badgley excels at, come on buddy, unclench, but because he represents something menacing that everyone, regardless of gender identity, has known or will come to know at some point in their life. <sighs> the comments under this video I can only imagine. For the record, I am 100% joking, I mean, I love men. I love Jung Hozok. Wait, I should I should put my man before that. I love my man. I love Jung Hozok. I love Jeff Goldblum. These are all very valid men. Joe Goldberg, on the other hand, is on thin fucking ice. The thing that Joe represents is much more than his gender identity. In fact, it's something that can be perpetuated by anyone not just men. In the past, we've used words like machismo or male chauvinism to describe men who behave and think like Joe. More recently, however, the term toxic masculinity has taken center stage. It first popped up in academic circles, specifically feminist circles, but has gained a footing among the general population. From signs at protests to incorrigible dialogue on arguably the best show on television right now, toxic masculinity has become ingrained in our understanding of gender roles. Well, kind of. Despite its usage on social media and in political spheres, the term toxic masculinity has become more of a buzzword. And like all great buzzwords, the public's understanding of it is very low. Now, I love a good discussion about toxic masculinity. 
watch any of my videos and you'll probably hear it mentioned once or 34 times. It's a very vague word that allows us to dip our toes in critical theory, if only for a second. The more I read about it, the more I realize just how vague it could be. In the problem with a fight against toxic masculinity, Michael Salter argues that, though its use is familiar in both progressive and conservative circles, neither group really has a true understanding of the forces at play within the toxic aspect of toxic masculinity. Salter asserts that beneath the general discussion of rigid gender guidelines and a culture that champions violence are other forces at play that sustain the entire structure of toxic masculinity, forces that often go overlooked. One example that Salter uses is that the alcohol industry allegedly funds research that purports violence being linked to masculinity and drinking culture rather than alcohol itself, despite the fact that studies show that domestic violence rises in places with a dense amount of liquor stores. As Heidi Matthews, an assistant professor of law at Osgoode Hall Law School at York University states, toxic masculinity, like what the scholar Catherine Rottenberg has called neoliberal feminism, quote, recognizes gender inequality while simultaneously denying that socioeconomic and cultural structures shape our lives. End quote. As a result, those who oppose toxic masculinity see it as systemic, but they don't seem to see the system. End quote. Toxic masculinity is about power, and it's about who has this power. Matthew cites the police industrial complex as another hidden force beneath the more general label of toxic masculinity. I would argue that race plays a big factor, specifically in terms of white supremacy. Therefore, the toxic masculinity Joe represents hides a system of power beneath it, a power that I would argue is characterized by his white male privilege and society's investment in upholding whiteness as superior. This is one of the themes Penn Badgley, who plays Joe, picked up on in the show. He states, I think what Joe is meant to be is an embodiment and a portrait of the parts of us that can't escape rooting for him. In a more just society, we would all see Joe as problematic and not be interested in the show. But that's not the society we live in. If anyone other than a young white man were to behave like these characters behave, nobody's having it." End quote. Parenthetical note here, I think what Penn Badgley is talking about leans more towards white supremacy rather than white privilege. I don't know if it's a privilege that white people can be protected or rewarded for acting like Joe. I think it's more so an entire white supremacist system that allows them to be protected. But I view it like a fruit of the tree. A lot of people are using white privilege in reference to that one kid who was just found not guilty of murdering protesters because they see an obvious inequality. Black and brown kids are executed by police and civilians for much less than what he did. But I don't think the situation is just white privilege at work. White privilege is becoming something we're finally willing to name, which is great, don't get me wrong, but there's an entire system of power at play that we're failing to see in certain situations. Power that you reap if you're a white person. Power that will continue to protect you and continue to oppress people of color. Picking up the fruit when it falls does nothing in the long run because the tree is still there. It's going to continue shedding fruit. The only way we can see action is by digging that bitch up. You have to go for the roots. I'm not solid in my theory, so I don't want to talk at length about that yet. So for now, white privilege. If you even so much as think that Chad has white privilege, he will be knocking your door down at 1 a.m. with a five-page research paper about how tough his life has been, how hard his family has worked for their wealth and real estate, how racism no longer exists in America because by golly, the Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal. The same declaration that was penned by slave owners in favor of the colonies that were 20% enslaved black people at the time. If you think like Chad, I'm really not gonna argue with you. Oh, wait, yes I am. People make understanding white privilege harder than it needs to be. And white people failing to see it or refusing to see it 
is by design. Peggy McIntosh wrote in a 1989 journal titled White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, quote, my schooling gave me no training in seeing myself as an oppressor, as an unfairly advantaged person, or as a participant in a damaged culture. I was taught to see myself as an individual whose moral state depended on her individual moral will. My schooling followed the pattern my colleague Elizabeth Minich has pointed out. Whites are taught to think of their lives as morally neutral, normative, and average, and also ideal, so that when we work to benefit others, this is seen as work which will allow them to be more like us." End quote. Macintosh compares white privilege to an invisible knapsack, a knapsack she was given at birth and one that she carries around with her without even having to think about it. This knapsack holds everything from advantages to pleasantries she may take for granted. It's important to note that people of color are not born with this invisible knapsack, and yet we're able to see it swaying on the backs of our white counterparts. Macintosh makes a list of things she attributes to white privilege, taking care not to include things that may be impacted by class, religion, or geographic location. But she notes that these things are inherently linked. A few items on the list include, quote, I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. I can turn on the television or open to the front page of the paper and see people of my race widely represented. I can do well in a challenging situation without being called a credit to my race. I can criticize our government and talk about how much I fear its policies and behavior without being seen as a cultural outsider. I can choose blemish cover or bandages in flesh color and have them more or less match my skin." End quote. Some of these seem harmless, right? They're mostly about being represented in the media, being left alone when you go shopping, never having to fear race plays a role in everyday interactions. That's what I mean when I say white privilege isn't as hard to understand as people make it seem. It doesn't mean you have a hard life. It doesn't mean you hate people of color. It doesn't mean you and Brad Pitt are besties. It means that society invests in you. It invests in you because it was built to uphold white supremacy. You are the expectation, not the exception. And look, I get it. You may be asking yourself why society would want to uphold systems of discrimination in a country founded on equality and freedom. But the answer to that is also simple. Who is free when the country was founded? And who does the country continue to protect? Think of it this way. I come from an immigrant father who came to America at 17 without his family and without much money. I also grew up in an abusive household. As a black woman, I face what scholars have called double jeopardy, where not only am I discriminated against for my gender, but I also face structural and individual racism. I grew up for a portion of my life in poverty. There were times where we didn't know where our next meal was coming from, times where we had to sit in dark or cold homes because our lights got turned off. And yet there are still parts of my identity that make me privileged. I am cisgender, meaning I am privileged because systems in our society protect me more than they would protect a trans person. I'm able-bodied, meaning I am not discriminated against by our ableist society the way a disabled person is. For instance, I don't have to worry about losing my benefits when I get married the way disabled people in America have to. I'm also college educated, which is something a large portion of our world will never experience due to finances or what have you. And as of now, I am financially stable. If there were an emergency, I would probably be able to cover it, unlike people who are impoverished. My blackness, womanhood, family immigration status, or abusive childhood doesn't negate my other sources of privilege. This privilege seems harmless, but on the other side of that privilege is an entire system. A system that discriminates, violates, and oppresses underprivileged people. You reap the benefits of structural racism while I suffer from it. For example, if we're both applying to the same jobs with the same resume, the same talent or hardworking skills as one another, and the only difference between us is that your name is Sally and mine is Shania, did you know you have a higher chance of being chosen for the job or at least called in for an interview because you have a stereotypically white name 
and I don't. Or to use the series You as an example, if people were to look at Marion, played by Tati Gabrielle, who is a Korean and Black woman, and then they were to look at Joe Goldberg, played by Penn Badgley, who is a white man, did you know people are more likely to view Marion as the villain in the show rather than the actual serial killer, stalker, and misogynist just because of her race? No? Well, it's happening on the You subreddit as we speak. I think the idea that Joe Goldberg's power lies within his white male privilege is evidenced perfectly by the way people treat the women on the show, especially the one woman of color. I'm not counting Karen Minty from season one because the show treated her bad enough and no one on Reddit seems to remember her anyways, but I digress. Let's start with Joe's first fixation on the show, Guinevere Beck. She has been called annoying, shallow, unspecial, and mediocre. She was so unlikable, in fact, that people cheered at her death. Some people even thought she deserved it. This reception can either be attributed to her characterization as an imperfect victim of domestic violence, which makes it harder for people to sympathize with her, or it can simply be because she's a woman. I do admit that she does come across as annoying sometimes, more so in the book than in the series, but damn, did I want the girl to die? As Shannon Sutorius explains in I Can Fix You, why we love Joe Goldberg and hate Guinevere Beck, Beck and Claudia are very similar characters. This matters for both Claudia and Beck's reception because it reveals something about us outside of viewership. It reveals something about us as people. Claudia was a character created especially for the series as she doesn't exist in the books. She's the mother of Paco, Joe's makeshift son figure whom he protects, feeds, and loves. Possibly the only authentic love Joe experiences in the entire show. Claudia is addicted to drugs, which she uses to cope with the violent abuse she experiences at the hands of her white, ex-law enforcement boyfriend. The similarities between Beck and Claudia really stop at the domestic abuse aspect of their characters. If anything, Claudia and Marion are almost identical in their characterization. But Sutoria states, quote, like Claudia admitting to putting her own child in harm's way and letting a man who beats her get away with it, Beck admits to being a woman with complications and harmful intentions. She admits to her her faults and issues, and by doing this, she shatters the view of innocent domestic abuse victims that society seems to accept for those wishing to report their abusers. She did not do what we deemed as, quote, right for a victim, end quote, and therefore her death is justified to us, end quote. Marion's reception is similar. She's a recovering addict who endangered her child's life by driving her around while under the influence. Despite cleaning her life up and trying her hardest to correct her past awful behavior, people still view her as a villain. She gets called boring, unnatural, annoying. They theorize that she's the one manipulating Joe with little to no evidence. They believe she was the one who acted violently against her ex-husband in the library, even though it was clear that he was the aggressor. They also think she just so happened to be the only you fixation that Joe doesn't have chemistry with, despite, you know, Natalie existing. And don't get me started on how everyone treated love. She was also called boring until she turned out to be just like Joe. And then season three came around and people started saying things like this. Quote, love is easily the most stressful wife any man can ever have. I completely don't blame Joe for losing interest in her and eventually killing her. Love caused most of the issues in this show. End quote. Viewers began saying that she was setting Joe's progress back, that she was at fault for Joe killing people in this season despite Joe killing people in every season, regardless of what woman he was fixating on. Love didn't make him push Marion's ex-boyfriend off the parking garage and stab him 34 times outside of a yoga class. Love didn't make him break into Marion's apartment and hide under her bed without her knowing. Love didn't make him cheat on her with the neighbor within three minutes of moving into their home. You know who made Joe do that? Joe made Joe do that. And Love just put an ax in the side of his mistress and bludgeoned her teenage boyfriend and tried to kill Joe and thought about killing Marion and got rid of Candace somehow and Delilah and by extension ruined Ellie's life. Am I missing any? We can blame her for those. Those are valid. You can also find power, AKA Joe's white male privilege in his entitlement. In a patriarchal society, especially one that favors men who look like Joe, men are conditioned to see themselves as the dominant identity. This leads to entitlement. I'm sure you've seen the news articles or survivor stories where women are attacked or killed 
for refusing a man's advances. You see it in the racialized attacks carried out by white men against people of color because they feel entitled to that person's life or that person's submission. Society is conditioning primarily white cis men to believe that everything in this world is theirs for the taking. We further condition them when we give them three months in jail for an unconscious girl behind a dumpster, when we allow them to go home and watch television after lynching a man on video, when we send them home to sleep and party at bars after shooting protesters, we tell them that they matter more than the person they harmed. And that is exactly what's happening with you to a lesser extent. For a large portion of the book, as well as in the television show, Joe Goldberg subscribes to this entitlement of power, not only over the women he romanticizes, but over other men who he perceives as feminine or weak. Being a big macho man or feeling low and emasculated are running themes throughout the novel. They're spoken much more explicitly and I would even say more frequently than in the show. On page 78, Joe rings up a customer who's buying Doctor Strange, the new Stephen King book that everyone within a 20 mile radius is raving about. And he states, quote, the next asshole is rummaging through his wallet for his credit card to buy his Stephen King so he can, fingers crossed, read about a sicko doing sick things because he's too much of a to do all the sick things he wants to do, things he probably wanted to do since he was a kid, end quote. And on the same page, Joe says of Benji, who he has locked down in the basement, quote, I'm doing the kid a favor. When he gets out of here, he's going to be pissed about being locked up, but he's also going to thank me for making him into a man, end quote. He calls Benji a princess, a sissy, and a on numerous occasions, three very feminine coded words that allude to his weakness, and says that when Mr. Mooney locked him up in a cage as a kid, he didn't, quote, fuss and shake like a little girl, end quote. Side note, but I also think it's great that the novel and television series shows this conditioning of young men taught through generations. Mr. Mooney and Joe's dad were two abusive, violent individuals, teaching Joe that this is how men show love. He even states in the book, Quote, Mr. Mooney cared enough about me to teach me a lesson. I learned. End quote. This ties back into a major theme Sarah Gamble claims to explore in the first season, as she states, quote, What messages are we feeding our little boys? And what's the worst case scenario of that? End quote. When Joe and Beck are on their first date, Joe stretches to, quote, remind Beck that he has biceps and he's ready to kill anyone who dare look at her, and that he would, quote, fucking kill Hugh Grant, end quote, because Beck once watched a movie with him in it. He feels entitled to Beck, especially to her body. His desire for her in so many words made me want to Or put simply, it made me want to vomit. He leers at her chest and separates their time spent together into categories based on how sexual it was. There's the sexless category, like listening to her feelings or getting lunch in the middle of the day. And there's the sexual category where Beck looks at him longer than three seconds, I guess. Joe states on page 168, quote, your body is an offering, a payment for all of those hands off phone calls, those lunches, your body and your hair and your lips and your thighs. Everything is for me, end quote. He complains when she asks him to run errands with her or spend time with her doing anything other than having sex, stating, Christmas shoppers walking by probably think I'm your gay best friend. My dick hurts, Beck. Where's my holiday? End quote. When they do finally have sex for the first time and Joe busts like a canned soda in a freezer, he, feel <laughs> he feels emasculated, powerless. He turns to the idea of self-harm in order to punish himself for being weak. Quote, I was going to fucking myself and everyone in the shop and take out the Eric Carmen CD and smash it into bits because I stopped believing in myself and our future, end quote. Later that day, he and Beck have date plans, but she bails. Joe throws a vase at the wall, but fails to break it. Quote, I must be the limpest limp dick in the world. I can't even break a vase. <laughs> he ends up setting his hand on fire with a candle as punishment and states, quote, I'd set my dick on fire if I could, but we know that I'm a limp dick. I don't have the balls. <laughs> I don't have the balls to do that, end quote. I'm oh, sorry. I really have to lay off the analysis for a second because some sentences are just better off heard than explained. Like this one. If I had a folding TV dinner tray, I would hurl it out of the window and pound my chest like a barbarian, like a thick dicked alpha gorilla. <laughs> None of these words are in the Bible. Not a single one. 
The second time Joe and Beck have sex, he says that he quote, owned her when he's inside of her, end quote. He goes into the bathroom afterwards and quote, pees all over the floor of the shower and marks his place, his home, and Beck, end quote. He is declaring her as property, claiming ownership over her like she's a possession to be had. On page 367, he states, you should own what you love. This is what the cage represents, Joe's entitlement, the final stage in owning someone and exerting power over them. He keeps them enclosed like one of his rare books, deciding for himself what they are allowed to eat, drink, and do within the cage. The cage is more or less a last chance for his victim to acknowledge him as the dominant one in the dynamic, the true man that they should respect. Beck's last moments within this box represent this idea as well. In the book, Joe has her read a Dan Brown book with him to re-spark their relationship. <clears throat> Nerd. Beck seduces him, lures him into the cage, and they have sex for a final time. As Joe leaves the cage, he leaves the door open behind him because, quote, in this new world, end quote, she's fully submitted to him, allowing him to own her even while she was trapped, signifying that his plan worked. Or so he thought. Because Beck didn't mean that shit. Fuck that shit and fuck Joe she said. She seduced him in order to escape, which she does attempt, yet fails to execute. In this scene of the book, we finally get deeper insight into Beck's character, and it sits at a complete opposite of the romanticized version Joe made her out to be. Quote, you always look at me like I'm so amazing, Beck states, and I don't know. I don't know why you do that, because I'm not, end quote. Joe is incensed by this point because he now understands that Beck will never fully submit to him, even after all he did to exert his power over her. He states, I killed for you. I deserve you, end quote. We end up in the same place we ended up in the first section, with Joe standing over Beck's dead body, lamenting over the loss of his true love. There is a medical condition called misophonia, which causes its sufferers to react with panic or even extreme rage at everyday sounds like chewing, humming, even breathing. Not everyone who hears the sound is going to react violently, but given the right set of preconditions, violence is absolutely possible. This is a quote from CBS's Criminal Minds in their 2018 episode, Mixed Signals. Mixed Signals follows the BAU's quest to track down a devolving unsub who kills his victims by drilling into the left side of their skull. This area, as the episode's medical examiner explains, is the temporal lobe, which houses the primary auditory cortex. It's in control of receiving auditory information and translating it for us to understand. This is significant because, like most Criminal Minds episodes, the MO often points to a motive, and that motive, also like most Criminal Mind episodes, is usually based on a mental disorder. In this case, the unsub has a condition called misophonia, a disorder that causes individuals to have heightened reactions to auditory stimuli. The episode depicts the unsub killing people due to a low frequency ringing in his head, a ringing that his victims can't seem to hear. It also serves as a double reference to the hum phenomenon, which has people all over the world, including in Taos, New Mexico, where the episode is set, reportedly hearing an unexplainable low buzzing or droning noise. While clinical reports suggest misophonia may cause people to lash out if they hear certain noises, it's said to only occur in extreme cases. And even then, according to Dr. Jennifer J. Brout, there is no scientific research that backs this up. The portrayal of misophonia leading someone on a random killing spree sat uncomfortably with Dr. Brout as a psychologist who specializes with the disorder. She decided to question Brian Fraser, a writer for Criminal Minds, about the portrayal, of which he stated, quote, Writing the show is a collaborative process, and ideas often flow from real life and personal experiences of the writers and actors. Someone may casually mention a psychological or psychiatric disorder that a relative or friend suffers from, and the writer's job is to explain how this particular disorder, or sometimes traumatic event, might lead to serial murder, end quote. Frazier's response calls into question what Andrew Barecki calls the show's frail attempts at sympathetic portrayals, end quote, where they try to emphasize that not everyone with a mental illness commits violent acts of murder while simultaneously striving to pervert the mental illnesses of their friends or family in order to fashion it into a stigmatizing portrayal for TV entertainment. 
These betrayals lead to a spread of misinformation via sensationalism and eventually leads to the fear and discrimination of mentally ill people. In Music and the Monster, Sounding Fear and Mental Illness in Criminal Minds, Andrew Barecki argues that the way in which Criminal Minds uses its musical score during scenes directly involving mentally ill people committing or alluding to violence further adds to the stigma of mental illnesses as it creates a negative reaction for audiences who hear the music coupled with the sensationalized violence carried out on screen. What a long sentence. But not every stigmatizing portrayal of mental illnesses or disabilities requires what Bereki refers to as, quote, conflicting images and sounds, end quote. Simple acts of stereotyping or exaggerating mental illnesses for the sake of entertainment leads to stigma. According to Kirsten Fawcett, these stereotypes and exaggerations can include portraying mentally ill people as dangerous, different in appearance, such as portraying them with wild eyes or a deformity, portraying them as childish or silly, negatively portraying them as all severe cases, insinuating that mentally ill people cannot strive for recovery, or portraying mental health facilities as creepy and haunted. The problem with these stereotypes and exaggerations is that they're often untrue, especially in terms of violence. In reality, mentally ill people are less likely to harm others than they are likely to be harmed. Caitlin O'Callaghan states that, quote, only three to five percent of violent acts are attributed to individuals with mental illness. In fact, people with severe mental illnesses are 10 times more likely to be victims of violent crime than the general population, end quote. Yet, Media depictions insinuate otherwise. Quote, Divenbach analyzed the portrayals of psychological disorders on primetime television. He found that characters who are identified through behavior or labeled as having a mental illness were 10 times more likely than other TV characters to commit a violent crime, and between 10 to 20 times more likely to commit a violent crime than someone with a mental illness would be in real life. End quote. This leads to tangible consequences for mentally ill people in real life, as social stigmas surrounding their disorders result in them losing social status, job opportunities, and even medical care. This is evidenced by the fact that people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, one of the most stigmatized mental disorders, may be turned away from treatment. According to Sandra H. Sulzer, quote, the majority of providers described in my sample openly excluded the BPD patient population from care. Colleagues don't touch it, one provider reported. All clinicians who described seeing these patients had stories of interacting with colleagues who didn't understand their decision. I mean, and they, the colleagues, literally said, I won't put any borderlines on my case. Are you crazy? You treat people with borderline. Are you nuts? End quote. This is the stigmatized culture surrounding such shows like You. Despite Joe not being formally diagnosed on the show, informal diagnosis is a whole other beast, fans have theorized that Joe has borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, erotomania, antisocial personality disorder, or obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Informal diagnoses include the following. Sarah Gamble, the executive producer and co-creator of the show, refers to Joe as unhinged on at least two occasions, another flattening word often used as a synonym for crazy. Interviewers casually throw around words like psychopathic and psycho. In the book, Beck calls Joe a rush of names like asshole, sick, and creep, among other more stigmatizing names like psycho, loon, nutjob, and freak. In the sequel, Hidden Bodies, Joe states in chapter two, I picked this song because I'm taking it all back, all the beautiful things in the world that were corrupted by my tragically ill girlfriend, Guinevere Beck. I see now that she suffered from borderline personality disorder. You can't fix that, end quote. Although Penn Badgley tries to amend this by saying the show is not a quote, clinical approach, end quote, there still seems to be a culture surrounding mental illness and you. So you may be asking yourself, like I am, after writing 20 pages of script so far, what the fuck is the point? The point is that you is not immune to portraying or insinuating negative stereotypes about mentally ill people, even if they pretend they aren't linking Joe's actions to a disorder by not diagnosing him. I want us to look at the different informal diagnoses provided provided for Joe Goldberg on social media and by the crew, and then I want to look at stigmas that are often associated with these specific disorders. Because I've got the time. Do you?
To start, Elizabeth Nabitha Esmeralda Rihi explores the psychology of Kepnes's version of Joe Goldberg, citing such studies as Bernadetta Nandita's 2019 thesis that evaluates the perceived histrionic personality disorder occurring in Amy Dunn, as well as the DSM-5 entries for antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. It is Rihi's argument that Joe Goldberg portrays both of these personality disorders, concluding that, quote, out of seven criteria of antisocial personality disorder, Joe Goldberg shows six of them, end quote, including failure to ascribe to social norms, deceitfulness, impulsivity, lack of remorse, irritability and aggression, and reckless disregard for the safety of self or others. Rehe goes on to state, Quote, whereas for narcissistic personality disorder, Joe Goldberg shows seven criteria out of nine. They are a grandiose sense of self-importance, believe they are special or unique, require excessive admiration, preoccupied with fantasies of ideal love, sense of entitlement, often envious of others, or believes that others are envious of them, and shows arrogant or haughty behaviors or attitudes. End quote. The choice to conflate Joe's actions with antisocial personality disorder directly feeds into the swarming culture of stigma surrounding personality disorders. Antisocial personality disorder has sort of been deemed the evil disorder with diagnosed individuals being compared to cold-blooded murderers. I've mentioned how clinicians react to personality disorders like BPD, but recent studies as of 2016 show that even the general public's perception of mental illnesses haven't improved too much. There is a continued report of prejudice and discrimination carried out against people with mental illnesses. For personality disorder specifically, the public assumes that these individuals are manipulating others into feeling sympathy for them, that they choose to commit certain actions and that they may misbehave or be difficult out of choice instead of something out of their control. This sort of stigma is especially harmful as it can lead to a rise in police violence against people with personality disorders as they are viewed as being intentionally difficult instead of mentally ill. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder is another fan favorite, with Kepnes's version of Joe Goldberg even telling his therapist that he has OCD. OCD and OCPD are two different diagnoses, but the general population's knowledge of OCD is far greater than most mental illnesses, leading OCPD to be a well-known disorder by association. In a personal essay written for Headspace, Nadia Schmidtke explains what it's like to live with obsessive compulsive personality disorder. A thick atmosphere of panic sets in because I have so much to do today. I'm falling behind in my studies. Do the dishes, run the errands, start on the publication. Find a way to have fun and relax. The irony. Buy groceries. Improve my lazy attitude and carry myself with more confidence. All this before breakfast. Panic turns quickly to dread as I revise my schedule and wonder what was making me feel so bad. I know I need to relax, but when I'm not productive, my mind swirls with thoughts of what I have to do, how to fix myself, and navigate working with others. OCPD is not a diagnosis we hear about. Overworking and perfectionism can sound like really positive traits, end quote. And yet, these traits landed Nadia in a psychiatric hospital for three weeks, where she was formally diagnosed with major depressive disorder and OCPD. The fact that OCPD is considered a well-known disorder simply because of OCD being a well-known disorder doesn't mean that people understand the complexities and hardship that these disorders bring. People throw around phrases like, I'm so OCD because they like to clean their room. Or in the case of you, Karen Minty says Joe is OCD on her. According to Caitlin O'Callaghan, these offhand mentions, quote, ignore the realities and seriousness of these illnesses. End quote. Next, we have erotomania or de Clerambault syndrome, named after French psychiatrist de Clerambault. This syndrome is explored at length in de Clerambault syndrome revisited, a case report of erotomania in a male by Maria Velada's and Lucilia Bravo. They defined erotomania as, quote, a psychiatric syndrome characterized by the delusional belief that one is loved by another person, generally of a higher social status, end quote. In the media, erotomania is as rare as the condition is in reality. However, nods to it exist, though many don't name drop the specific disorder. For example, 
Glenn Close, who played Alex in 1987's Fatal Attraction, states that she wasn't aware her character's actions were related to any disorder, let alone erotomania. In the film, Alex was a book editor who had a sexual encounter with Dan, a married man. That's called motherfucking bars complete. You know nothing about that. When she couldn't rekindle the relationship, Alex began threatening and eventually attacking Dan, his daughter, and his wife. Glenn Close said that she prepped for the role by speaking to two psychiatrists, both of whom never mentioned a disorder by name. It wasn't until the movie was released that Close first heard her character's actions being conflated with erotomania. I was in fatal attraction, she stated, and that played into the stigma. I would have a different outlook on that character. I would read the script totally differently." End quote. Alex from Fatal Attraction is not the only erotomania coded character in the media. For starters, there's like 24 different versions of Fatal Attraction, including a film starring Beyonce Giselle Knowles Carter, so there's that. All of these films typically show quote unquote obsessed women who create large romances out of brief encounters and will stop at nothing to get their love interest to notice them. Though the plot will get tweaked here and there across the films, these movies all have in common the quest to position mentally ill-coded characters as the antagonizers. While Joe is noted to have erotomania, if the Wikipedia page is of any merit, he's still portrayed sympathetically, a point that was brought up in a submission I got for this video. Quote, I haven't seen you, so I can't speak of portrayal of erotomania there, but I just wish I could have female presenting characters with erotomania that were portrayed just as sympathetically as that guy." End quote. Another thing you has in common with these movies is the intention to position mentally ill people as the other as opposed to the innocent, safe, default main characters. Let me explain. <laughs> You know how in the previous sections we talked about how structures of white power have essentially flattened blackness into something unfamiliar? While whiteness as a whole remains relatable to everyone and default in society, the same occurs for all divested groups, including disabled and mentally ill people. Using the work of Mary Beth Oliver in a theory known as Affective Disposition Theory, Barecki analyzes how perceived others are treated in the media, both in regards to race and mental illness. Mary Beth Oliver, of whom he draws information from, details how the media often depicts non-white characters as aggressors or criminals, furthering preconceived notions about minorities to white audiences. When these notions are confirmed by the media, especially by crime reality shows like Cops, white audiences further themselves from minorities, placing them as the other in opposition to their white self or default. Barecki argues that mentally ill and disabled people are treated this way in the media as well, with able-bodied and neurotypical people serving as the self and disabled, mentally ill, and neurodivergent people serving as the other. This is a big theme in the horror genre, which I failed to mention in my last video. It reminds me of Halloween's reception by the general public. When Laurie Strode rips the mask off of Michael Myers, the antagonist of the film, we get a glimpse of the actor who plays Myers. Audiences everywhere believe that Myers was disfigured in some way, so much to the point that the director of the movie had people coming up to him, saying how brilliant the scene was for showing the killer's disfigured face. It added to the creep value, many of the fans said. Yet. Michael Myers was not disfigured in the first movie. He was played by Toni Morin, and that's just Toni's face. When I first read about that, I instinctively laughed because why did so many people think Myers was disfigured when he wasn't? But then I realized that there was almost an expectation for mentally ill people to be different from non-mentally ill people in order for non-mentally ill people to feel secure in themselves. In the media's eyes, and therefore the eyes of society, the other is coded as different from the self and is more likely to perpetrate crime or violence. Barecki uses Dr. Spencer Reed as an example since Matthew Gray Goobler, the actor who portrays Reed, claims he shows, quote, hints of schizophrenia, Asperger's syndrome, and minor autism, end quote. Just for the record, there are a few autistic people who have issues with that specific quote from Matthew Gray Goobler, not because they don't believe Reed is on the spectrum, but 
because of the insinuation that Asperger's and autism are separated, as Asperger's is now believed to be on the autism spectrum. I tried researching more into that, but I haven't found a lot of sources directly from autistic people. So if any autistic people, specifically people who have been diagnosed with Asperger's in the past before it was taken out of the DSM-5, have the energy or are comfortable doing so and comment your thoughts about this, that would be amazing. All right, back to it. The hints of schizophrenia are especially concerning to Reed in the show, as his mother was diagnosed with schizophrenia and he quotably apprehends a lot of schizophrenic unsubs in his line of work. Because of this, Spencer fears that this diagnosis will cause him to lash out violently or in turn be hunted down by the very FBI team he works with. Brecky states, Reed's fears of becoming a killer and being hunted by the BAU demonstrate that the characters themselves consider the mentally ill as primarily violent criminals, end quote. This is also true of disabled representation in the media. Barecki references an analysis of Dancer in the Dark, which is about a woman who is actively losing her vision and resorts to violent murder after someone takes advantage of her blindness. Her son is also at risk of losing his vision if she can't afford the medical costs for surgery in time. At the end of the movie, her son receives successful treatment and she is convicted of murder and faking her blindness in order to exploit the American healthcare system, which is just, wow. She is subsequently sent to the gallows for execution. The study of this movie, conducted by Jennifer Iverson, concludes, quote, films typically depict disability as a pathology of individual bodies rather than a construct of social stigma and discrimination. If the disabled character cannot pass or be miraculously cured, filmic narratives eradicate the character, thus implying that the external disability is a sign of internal deformities and that the character must be removed for the good of society. In this way, the incurable disabled character is commodified, institutionalized, demonized, ignored, or murdered. In Longmore's words, better dead than disabled, end quote. Further stigma can be found even in more recent films like 2019's Joker. I really hate to even bring this movie up because I just know I'll get a commenter who's like, actually Joker was a cinematic masterpiece and got my divorced parents to remarry me and gave me $8 billion so I can retire at the age of six. We get it. We get it, but we live in a society. In why Joker's depiction of mental illness is dangerously misinformed, Annabelle Driscoll and Mina Hussein argue that despite its attempts to start a conversation about mental health, Todd Phillips' Joker only adds to the stigma surrounding mental illnesses. By correlating the Joker's descent into violence alongside the deterioration of his mental health and his slow reduction of medicine intake, the film can be considered yet another cog in the wheel of stigmatized portrayals. Driscoll and Hussein state, Arthur's supposed loss of grip on reality is suggested by a peppering of nods to psychotic symptoms, delusional ideas of a grandiose nature, and hallucinations of his neighbor, which are confirmed by his eventual admission to a psychiatric institution. The result of this is to, disappointingly, remove Arthur's agency and divert attention from a potentially more stimulating conversation about wealth inequality and its responsibility for societal collapse." End quote. Driscoll and Hussein also argue that the movie flattened Arthur's symptoms, making it seem like a conglomerate of many different illnesses, furthering the belief that mental illnesses are all the same. And you fans think Joe is a psychopath, but mental health experts say they're wrong, Julia Naftalin interviews social scientist Pamela Rutledge, who states Joe, quote, seems to be an amalgam of personality traits at abnormal levels that are constructed to make a good story and create a character that elicits a certain amount of empathy. But the reality, Naftalin goes on to say, is that, quote, very few people with mental illness behave like this in real life." End quote. Mental illness, of course, is a spectrum. Two people who are diagnosed with the same mental health disorder probably won't exhibit identical symptoms. But the point of all of this is that misinformed or outright offensive portrayals of mental health disorders and disabilities only aid in the normalization of sanism and ableism in our society. Ableism is tentatively defined as, quote, discrimination in favor of able-bodied people 
people. Sanism, on the other hand, refers to the discrimination of mentally ill or neurodivergent people. Sanism tends to get absorbed under ableism, especially for those who have mental illnesses that are disabling. I think for this video, I will refer to them separately while keeping in mind that there can be overlap between them. One easy way to see how normalized ableism and sanism is in our society is to look at everyday phrases and words we use as casual descriptors. Words like tone deaf, stupid, crazy, the R slur, and bipolar. According to Sumadri Banerjee, words have power, and often able-bodied and neurotypical people have the ability to wield that power against disabled, mentally ill, and neurodivergent people. Quote, in such an environment where misconceptions about mental health abound, ableist language helps perpetuate negative stereotypes about those suffering from psychosocial disabilities and further stigmatizes any helpful talk around mental illness. After all, a person suffering from anxiety or depression would be much less likely to come forward and discuss these issues when their very illness is trivialized and treated as a joke. Another way we see ableism and sanism being normalized is the prison industrial complex. Mentally ill people make up a larger population in prison demographics than they do mental health facilities. It has been argued at length by academics that our culture's insistence on stigmatizing and betraying mental illnesses as a catalyst for violence has led to the rising population of mentally ill people in the prison system. I know there are people out there who will say, well, they're there because they committed a crime. And I mean, there's a lot to be said about that statement. I'm not saying mentally ill or disabled people aren't capable of committing crimes. However, stigma, a lack of proper training and education for police, as well as ableist structures that lead to lack of resources for mentally ill and disabled people directly funnel them into the system. It reminds me of the school to prison pipeline where black and brown people, especially young black boys, are disproportionately funneled into the prison system from their school. There are so many levels that aid in this disappearance of black and brown people, including high police presence in predominantly black schools, zero tolerance policies, and even the dependence on disciplining children with on-campus police for minor offenses they committed in the classroom, like disobeying the teacher. We see this happen and we automatically think it's justice because of the historical demonization of these identities. Speaking of historical demonization, the stigma associated with ableism and sanism has been weaponized against people of color, queer people, and trans people for years. Because mental illness is seen as this horrible, evil thing to have, it seemed like a fitting label for queer people, trans people, and people of color just because they were perceived as different from white, straight, cis people. It became a thing where mental illness was synonymous with being a social outsider. Therefore, everyone who didn't fit into acceptable categories had to be mentally ill. In the late 19th century, psychiatrists began analyzing the possible mental illness behind queerness. This led to queer people being lobotomized were treated with conversion or aversion therapy. The American Psychiatric Association even considered being gay a mental illness until 1987, when they took it out of the DSM altogether. Trans people face the same discrimination. Who listed being transgender as a mental health disorder in a 1990 edition of ICD, which stands for the International Classifications of Diseases? In order to be considered a mental health disorder, it has to cause you distress and dysfunction. So they viewed being transgender as a cause for those feelings. I think although mental health disorders are common within the LGBTQ plus community, especially depression and anxiety, it does doesn't stem from their gender identity or their sexuality. It stems from the fact that queer and trans people are treated with such violence and dehumanization that it impacts their mental health. We have a history of being lobotomized and forced to vomit at pictures of our loved ones to scare the gay away, for God's sake. I think WHO revised the ICD in 2018 and now trans identity is no longer classified as a mental health disorder. Specifically for race, black people were disproportionately diagnosed with various mental disorders as a way to explain our inferiority to white people or to keep us enslaved. 
David R. Williams et al., authors of Race and Mental Health, Patterns and Challenges, states, quote, a report based on rates of mental illness in the 1840 census falsified Black insanity rates to show that the further North Blacks live, the higher their rates of mental illness. This was interpreted as evidence that freedom made Blacks, quote, crazy. In fact, Blacks were regarded as so constitutionally suited for slavery that the very desire to escape slavery was defined as a mental illness called drapetomania, end quote. Or because racist people are so good at being contradictory, they even argued that freed slaves would have less chances of developing mental illnesses because they were treated with such care and supervision while they were enslaved. More recently is the racialized shift in schizophrenia diagnoses, as explained by Jonathan Metzl. This source was sent in to me by a subscriber, so I greatly thank you because this shit is fucked up. Metzl explains how he went through hundreds of patient charts from a closed down asylum called Iona State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. An interesting side note here is that Iona State Hospital for the Criminally Insane shut down in the late 70s where it reopened as a correctional facility. Funny how that works. Metzl notes how previous diagnoses of schizophrenia were at times assigned to women who weren't considered good mothers or wives based on the gender expectations at the time. In fact, one of the patient charts described a woman with schizophrenic traits as getting confused and talking too loudly, which embarrassed her husband. Then, at the height of social unrest in the mid to late 60s, a shift occurred in diagnoses. More black men were getting diagnosed with schizophrenia, and they were often related in some way or another to the civil rights movement. Even the DSM revised its criteria in DSM-2, including aggression and hostility as requirements for someone to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. This disproportionately impacted Black people, especially those who were arrested during protests. They became more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia than their white counterparts. Metzl even argues that this racialized shift is how schizophrenia came to be stigmatized as a violent disorder in the first place. That's some fucked up shit. I would highly recommend you go read that source. Lydia Brown, author of Why the Term Psychopath is Racist and Ableist, also notes how antisocial personality disorder, or the psychopath label, disproportionately affects people of color. One of the requirements of being diagnosed with this disorder is to have a history of criminal arrest and misconduct. Quote, ASPD, CD, and ODD are recognized and codified as psychiatric conditions by the medical establishment. And who are the people typically diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, conduct disorder, and oppositional defiant disorder. They are overwhelmingly poor students of color, especially dark-skinned people of color, who frequently have other disabilities." End quote. Brown goes on to state, quote, ASPD is most often a tool for criminalizing poverty, blackness, brownness, and disability. It is the diagnostic label that legitimizes non-compliance as a mental health problem. Refusal to take medications? Non-compliant. Failing math class? Non-compliant. Stemming in public? non-compliant. If you are non-compliant, you are antisocial. You are mentally ill. You are a psychopath." End quote. This normalization is why people feel so damn comfortable diagnosing Joe Goldberg and celebrities and strangers on the internet. They don't really see mentally ill and disabled people as people. And I'm not saying that I'm above participating in inherently ableist or sanest things. I think my Ted Bundy video is a great indicator of that because I primarily use sources from academics and clinicians and a lot of that information was steeped in sanest rhetoric. Even though I'm trying to learn more from disabled and other mentally ill people, I still have moments where I fail to be wholly inclusive. For instance, in the community post where I asked disabled people to chime in with their experiences, I didn't even think to add alternative text to the image so people who it needed would be able to know what the fuck I was talking about. It really made me realize not only how privileged I am to the point where I don't have to think about these things and don't notice when other people leave these things out, but it makes me realize how normalized and ingrained into our society it is for us to essentially disregard disabled or mentally ill people. And without a shadow of a doubt, it was not my work 
or my own thought processes that led me to these conclusions. I think no matter how much I read about something or try to educate myself, I will never be able to fill every gap because experience is the most important part of knowledge. This was taught to me by disabled people, other mentally ill people, chronically ill people, and neurodivergent people. I would like to take this time to share some firsthand experiences that were so thoughtfully provided by you guys about ableism in the media. And I just want to say that I appreciate you taking the energy and the time to further educate me and to allow me to share these stories with my audience in order to educate them as well. Because as Annalise says, a lovely subscriber who sent me a submission, the absence of lived experience means that the monotonous despair of coping with disability under a system that seeks to further disable you is never present. Instead, an able perspective of disability is given, where the disability itself is the tragedy and not the social and economic implications that follow." End quote. I asked, can you define ableism in the media? Apollo, a black trans neurodivergent slash chronically ill and physically disabled teenager replied, for me, ableism in media is the lack of effort in correct portrayals slash languages slash references. Hi, I'm Sarah, I have autism. So define ableism in media. Well, honestly, I would say the main issue with ableism in media and the way that I would define it is just feigning representation while still lacking representation. So, for example, wanting to portray autism but not having anyone who's acting actually be autistic. <laughs> you know, none of the actors are actresses. Also, none of like the directors, the producers, the writers, anyone involved in the process. It's like a really big issue of like, we want to portray this thing, but we're not going to ask anybody about it. Annalise uses they, them pronouns and their disabilities include, quote, the formal diagnoses of ADHD, dyslexia, neurosensory deficit, type 2 diabetes, an unspecified eating disorder, unspecified anxiety, chronic depression, OCD, and asthma. Their self-diagnoses include, quote, autism, dyspraxia, emetophobia, visual snow syndrome, and CPTSD, end quote. Annalise concludes their introduction with, quote, I am intersex and fat. End quote. Aspects of ableism in the media include, but aren't limited to, the non-disabled gays, industrial complexes which make money off of disabled body minds, being consulted with on disability representation, non-disabled actors portraying disabled characters, dissemination of pseudo-slash-bad science resulting in stigmatization of already stigmatized disabilities, normalization of the incarceration of disabled people such as those with addiction diseases or stigmatized neurodivergences like schizophrenia or personality disorders disorders as being for the greater good of the non-disabled public, magnification of majority populations, white, non-queer, non-intersex as being disabled, prioritization of neurotypical, allistic, and abled forms of movement, communication, and ways of being. The next part of the prompt asks, how do media portrayals of your specific disability or mental illness impact you? R says, I have been diagnosed with disassociative identity disorder since 2019 and have experienced the symptoms since childhood. DID is when a child, usually ages 5 to 7, experiences repeated trauma before the age of integration of one's personality and identity and compartmentalizes into separate states of consciousness. Alter is short for alternate states of consciousness. Ableism in the media towards this disorder are very hostile and willfully ignorant, ranging from are you going to hurt me or others to I wish I had that disorder. Doctors and nurses are not even taught updated terms and symptoms, and they are still going off of those from the 90s. DID is not rare and is at the same percentage of the population of people with red hair at about 2% worldwide. Anonymous says, for reference, I am professionally diagnosed with some mental illnesses which are anxiety, depression, ADHD, BPD, and mild psychosis. I think media representation adds more stigma to mental illnesses because we are often portrayed as weird or the outcast. Either that or they are often portrayed as babies who can't take care of themselves. They also like to glamorize these mental illnesses, especially depression, to make it seem like some sort of quirky disease, when in reality it destroys you from inside. It makes it difficult to do daily tasks like getting out of bed, showering, etc. On the other hand, other mental illnesses like psychosis, BPD, or DID are often demonized by the media to make it seem like people who have these illnesses are inherently evil. In reality, 
reality, we aren't these comical villains who would pounce on any chance to act violent. Hello. Okay. My name is Leah Tourette Syndrome and I'm here to talk about ableism for information purposes. In media, I feel like ableism has always shown. I feel like ableism was always there. I feel like showing disabled people for the sake of comedy was always a thing everywhere. And now it's circled to TikTok in modern age, you know, society and media. Whether you're on YouTube, TikTok or whatever, you will see ableism. And it's usually from the perspective of a more in-depth and harder to read type of ableism, which is the type that romanticizes the easy parts of a disability and then fully negates the hard parts of the disability, which is romanticizing. People saying, I really want to have tics. This has happened online and also IRL. People saying, oh, tics are so cute. I really want a tic disorder. I've heard it everywhere. And that leads into people spamming words in lives to get the person to tick that word. Cheyenne says, hello, my name is Cheyenne Langford and I'm blind. I was born with non-hereditary glaucoma. When we are portrayed, it goes one of two ways. We're superheroes or pitiful, so we can be someone else's inspiration porn. They use the blindness itself as the character's personality. The only show to write a blind character as a person with thoughts and feelings is Avatar The Last Airbender. While Toph does technically fall under the blind person with superpower stereotype, the writers worked very hard to make sure that her blindness wasn't her whole personality. I really wish other writers slash producers would use Toph as a model of how to write blind characters. Anonymous says, Hi, I wanted to write in about my experience as a Jewish lesbian with near debilitating borderline personality disorder. I have had to confront the comfort that the representation gave me because sadly, I saw my worst traits in these characters and that gave me a weird sort of validation. But I had to examine why I saw that representation in only villains because neurotypicals want my disorder and in turn my experiences to be villainized. I wish more people understood that BPD isn't a character flaw or a villain an origin story. It simply makes you kind of annoying, lol, but not irredeemable. What I was consuming also led to internalized hatred and belief I was undeserving of love because behaviors I can't control be viewed as villainous. But I found comfort in what I saw because that was all I saw. This revelation has also led me to deconstruct the importance I used to place on representation. As I've gotten older, I realize I don't need to be seen by people who aren't like me to see myself, if that makes sense. I am me and that is enough. I don't need to see myself to be validated, as long as any portrayals of me aren't villainized. As both a Jew and a sapphic, I have been led to believe that every aspect of myself is villainous, wrong, trickery, manipulative, and the portrayal of my mental illness through villains and bad people made me see my mental illness in the same way. Unlearning harmful stereotypes is hard, but I try. Madison states, So I have asthma, moderate to severe when not controlled, mild to moderate with my meds, and depending on the time of the year and my other health and all of that jazz. I was born eight weeks early with severely underdeveloped lungs and have been medicated for asthma for as long as I can remember. There is genuinely no good representation of respiratory disabilities that I can think of. You can probably find plenty of characters that have asthma, but if it is ever brought up, it's almost exclusively as a joke. The number of scenes where the character, typically kid, puffs their, typically his, inhaler as a like silly haha -ha, look they can't breathe bit is just silly. For plenty of people, asthma is something they've grown out of or whatever, but for people like me, I'll never be able to breathe right. Having people think I'm lazy or not trying hard enough or making a big deal out of nothing sucks, especially as a fat person where those ideas slash traits are automatically applied to me because of my weight. I'm not a person of color, but I can only imagine how having an invisible chronic illness slash disability like asthma feels when you're already in a marginalized community. Black Americans have the highest rates of asthma in the country, and the AAFA have done some good research into racial disparities in respiratory illness." End quote. Maria says, My name is Maria, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm the host of a dissociative identity system. We saw your post on Instagram and thought we'd contribute if that's alright. We are physically disabled, half blind, half deaf, chronic fatigue, epilepsy, anemia, we have a stutter if that counts, etc, etc. Neurodiverse, autistic, and struggle with mental disorders such as depression, derealization, PTSD, and anxiety. 
And obviously, we don't speak for the communities we are a part of as if we are the end-all, be-all. Everyone's experiences are incredibly specific and diverse. For us specifically, ableism in the media comes across as demonization and misrepresentation, specifically of DID, and people not taking our physical disabilities seriously and using them as comic relief or ignoring complex disabilities because, quote, they're too hard to work with, end quote, and also acting like there is only one way to be disabled. The media is fond of the trope of characters having a secondary side that controls them and usually is evil. This is particularly harmful because when I try to explain DID to people so they'll treat us as more than subhuman, they assume that there are evil alters. And in some cases, we have been asked, so which one of you is the evil one outright? In hindsight, I realized that it would also benefit to hear from disabled and mentally ill people about their lived experiences outside of media stigma and character representation. So I want to dedicate this section to a spur of the moment prompt. How have people treated you since they became aware of your disability or mental illness? I do know that I started hearing more about fibromyalgia between 2012 and 2016 before I got my diagnosis. Um, and during that time period, I remember that there were people that would come up to me and talk to me about uh, a friend of a friend of a friend or like a long distant family member or something like that. And they would absolutely come up and share that that, that person said they had fibromyalgia or was diagnosed with fibromyalgia and very much related them to making it up, to uh, talking about them in the vein of them being lazy, of them being a hypochondriac. I heard that kind of relation a lot when I was younger. When I realized that I did have fibromyalgia and I was realizing that the daily pain and the extreme detriment to my quality of life were connected to fibromyalgia, I thought about those comments and the people who those comments were made against and realizing that there were these people who were experiencing fibromyalgia and were being called by their friends and family lazy or liars and it was an intensely sad period of my life battling my own inner thoughts for not having the same kind of mobility that I used to and scared that I would be accused of the same things behind my back from the people that I knew and cared about. Lauren is a person with schizophrenia who runs the YouTube channel Living Well with Schizophrenia. She makes videos as educational resources on schizophrenia slash schizoaffective disorder for quote, people with the diagnosis, their loved ones, and for people who just want to learn more about the illness. She didn't submit anything, but I found her videos while researching and I thought it would be a welcome inclusion. In a video titled Conservatorships and Mental Illness, Lauren discusses the Free Britney movement and whether conservatorships slash guardianships are ethical in regards to mentally ill people. Quote, so I have been in the position multiple times before where I have been deemed incompetent and unable to make decisions for myself as it pertained to my care. I cannot begin to tell you how dehumanizing and condescending this felt. I felt like I was being told I wasn't a real person and that others would be making all my decisions for me going forward, which was essentially what was happening, end quote. Though Lauren acknowledges that there may be situations where it could be unsafe for someone with a debilitating mental illness to be in charge of their financial and personal life, she states, quote, I'm not sure if this process is always this ethical, however, in deciding whether someone is capable or not of managing their own affairs. And lastly, Shania says, I was diagnosed with bipolar 2 and generalized anxiety disorder around the end of 2017 or sometime in 2018. According to the DSM-5, bipolar disorder is described as, quote, a clinical course of reoccurring mood episodes consisting of one or more major depressive episodes and at least one hypomanic episode. A major depressive episode may feature, quote, depressed mood for most of the day every day, insomnia or hypersomnia nearly every day, fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day, feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt, and reoccurrent thoughts of death. Bipolar 2 is characterized by hypomania instead of the full-blown mania associated with bipolar 1. The manual emphasizes that bipolar 2 is not a quote, milder form, end quote, of bipolar compared to bipolar 1 because bipolar 2 individuals, quote, have greater chronicity of illness and spend, on average, more time in the depressive phase of their illness, which can be severe and or disabling, end quote. When I was diagnosed, it felt like something awakened not only in me, but within everyone around me, something that was tangible. And 
I could see it on everyone's face when I told them about it. I could feel them tense as if I just told them I murdered someone five minutes prior and I needed help hiding the body. And in a way, I assume I did. Bipolar disorder is often conflated with violence in television shows and movies. People ask what drove a serial killer to slaughter a bunch of innocent people and bipolar floats up in the conversation. This diagnosis has been used against me in order to invalidate my feelings. I'm not allowed to show irritation or annoyance or have my face set up in any kind of way because certain people think I'm going through a mood swing. Even if my emotions were caused by a direct valid reason, the word bipolar was still used against me like an accusation. I think the world has a very unclear idea of what bipolar is. I think the constant use of it as a buzzword has sort of watered down the very real and scary aspects of the disorder. I don't just laugh one second and cry the next. I have severe bouts of depression. I have to force myself to act lively, especially for work, even if all I want to do is lay in bed and stare at a wall. I'm left fatigued and empty and nothing interests me not even YouTube, which has been my dream since starting it last year. The beginning of 2020 was maybe the last most intense depressive episode I've experienced. It lasted from January to March, and I know this because I thought it was smart to document every last detail in my journal. <laughs> She's depressed, but she still has time to write. I know that's right. <laughs> and the funniest part, funny to me, maybe not to you, is that the last entry of my episode that I wrote down was a reasons to live chart and a reasons to die chart. And you can assume which one outweighed which. On the very next page, maybe a month later, the first sentence is, okay, wow, Miss Drama Queen, I'm alive. <laughs> I'm sorry if this is not funny to you. I understand it's really heavy, but I think it's great to be able to look back on that and realize that I'm still here. So what does this all mean for Joe Goldberg, the series You, and the people who are probably getting tired of hearing me talk at length about something that could have been summarized in about 20 minutes. It means that one, I was an English major and we had word counts up to here. If I can talk for 40 plus pages, I'm a talk for 40 plus pages. Second, it means that negative associations between mental illness and violence, as well as misrepresentations of mental illness, leads to unfair discrimination and further isolation for these individuals who are already systematically oppressed via an ableist and sanist society, as Megan Smith states. So what's so dangerous about portraying criminals as objectively different? It helps create an us versus them barrier that isn't real. Criminal minds assumes there are criminals and then there are normal people. These suspects are so profoundly other that we can assure ourselves that we will never be like them in any way. But all criminals are human and we, the viewers, are human. So what separates us from the killers? The answer for most people, especially the BAU, is that they must be sick. End quote. That's the thing I dislike the most about the mentally ill theory that fans on Reddit have proposed, that it implies only a mentally ill person would commit these sort of atrocities, when really that's not the case. It's very possible for you to be a commentary on white supremacy, ableist culture, the patriarchy, all of these systems that perpetuate violence against people of color, women, disabled, and mentally ill people. It would take a bit of restructuring in order to make these themes undebatable, but I think it does have immense possibility. It also makes me wonder how much responsibility should be given to the writers and cast for this. I don't think they can control what viewers say about the show, obviously, but I wonder if it's possible to make their stance on this subject clear, rather than brief mentions about how it's not a clinical show, if that makes sense. I don't really have the answers to that <laughs> because, you know, I'm still learning about all of this myself. I just think the show loses its luster and a great majority of the audience loses their empathy when we fall into age-old rhetoric about mental illnesses. Anyways, thank you guys for watching, if you even made it this far. Like all of my videos, the topics I covered here are all tentative. I'm still in the process of learning, as I will forever be, because 
learning doesn't end at a certain stage or at a certain attainment of knowledge. If I missed anything or if anything in this video needs to be clarified or corrected, by all means, leave a comment down below so I can make sure to keep it in mind going forward. Thank you to everyone who submitted something and thank you to the hundreds of comments I got under that original community post. I wish I could have included them all. Please go check those out for more firsthand stories and thank you again. I'm gonna go drink some water, take a goddamn nap, and finally peel off the skin of this alter ego because baby it was draining me. Have a good day or night or afternoon and I will see you in my next video. Yeah, that's, that's, that's all. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say. What do I do now? <laughs>